in their defense, there's two different CDs back there, so I'm sure they'll flip it around and get the other one. So if we'll go ahead and stand and do our congregation hymn first, abide with me, then we'll come back to the choir. Oh. CD track 
the Bible declares that God inhabits the praise of his people. And the Bible tell, also tells us that if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out and do it. And I'm grateful that we as the believers in the Lord Jesus have the freedom, the privilege to worship our Lord. It's good to see you tonight in the house of the Lord. For those who visit with us, we thank you for coming and worshiping with us. And uh, if you are a guest, we, we welcome you. And there's a perforated edge in the bulletin. If you'd tear that off and, and drop in the offering plate, let us have a record visit. But my, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord last night and this morning and tonight and then again tomorrow night for this weekend revival. Uh, Brother Stewart asked me how it went. I said, well, last night was just wonderful. Man, what a great, great service. The preaching this morning was suspect, but we're going to have a great, great message tonight. And um, we are excited. And then tomorrow night, tomorrow night's pack a pew night. And uh, we expect there to be a full house tomorrow night. And so thank you for all the work you've done in preparation for this. And, and, and I'll say more about Brother Stewart in just a moment, but we're grateful to have him. But the scripture tonight is this. The Bible asked the question, and the psalmist said in Psalm 85 in verse 6, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Folks, when there's a revival in the heart, when there's joy in the heart, there's praise that comes through the lips. And so we're grateful tonight for the privilege we have to once again gather in his house and to worship him. And I want to ask you if you would to join me as we pray and invoke God's, uh, ask God's blessings, pray that he'll come. Listen, as I said last night, we won't have revival unless he sends it. We'll just have a meeting. But I'm praying this revival will live on in the hearts of the people. So join me. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege that we have once again to assemble in your house of worship. Lord, we thank you for what our hearts have already felt this weekend. And Lord, I pray that the, the, the services that have, have already been and those that are tonight and to come uh, will be a blessing in our lives so that, Lord, we'll be drawn closer to you. And it's our desire, Father, to walk with you. And Lord, I pray that you would just bring revival to our hearts. And Lord, we pray that you would bring growth to our body. And I pray, Father, that because of this weekend, we'd have a greater zeal to serve you, a greater zeal to evangelize. And Lord, may we be the people that you've called us to be. So Lord, we thank you for this revival weekend. And we thank you for the men who have come to be a part of this. And I pray your blessings upon them. Lord, I thank you for Brother Stewart and in his ministry, and I pray, God, that you would anoint him tonight afresh and anew. Lord, I pray that he would preach as a dying man to a dying world. Lord, I pray, Father, that there would be life. I pray that there would be life that would grow out of this service so that, Lord, we would die to self and, and Lord, live to you and that our, our life and ministry uh, might uh, go out to the highways and hedges. And so, Lord, again, thank you for the privilege that we have to serve you Bless us tonight as we sing, as we, as we uh, feast around the Word, and then, Lord, as we come to the invitation, I pray that eternal decisions will be made here this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
according to choir is coming down, I ask you to stand with us and we'll sing our offertory hymn while the choir is coming out into the congregation. Great is thy faithfulness. Hymn number 216 or you can follow along on the screen behind. Great is thy faithfulness O God my Father There is no shadow of Turning with thee, thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not.
blessings of mine within thousand years Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, your mercies I see. come into the time in the service, we give back to the Lord, and as we shared with you last night, we'll be taking a special offering each night for the guest evangelist. This is not it. This is the regular offering for the tithes and the offerings of the church. At the close of the service tonight, we'll receive that love offering, and, um, and uh, we thank you for how you've already given uh, this weekend and and uh, whatever comes in during tonight, last night, tonight, and tomorrow night will be divided in thirds, and we'll send a check to each of the guest evangelists that have preached for us this weekend. But this is regular tithes and offerings uh, that we'll receive to uh, pay for the work and the ministry of the church. And so uh, thank you for all that y'all y'all do in giving. Let me, while I'm here, just go ahead and introduce, y'all may be seated, well, let me go ahead and introduce our guest evangelist before we receive the offering. And, and after the offertory, um, Brother Ken's going to come and sing. And then Dr. Stuart Houston is going to come and preach for us. As I began to pray about who to invite um, to come and be a part of this revival weekend, uh, the first person that God impressed upon my heart to call was Stuart Houston. And um, I, I prayed over it, and I prayed over it, and the Lord said, call Stuart. And so he was uh, gracious and willing to come and, uh, and preach for us. Uh, it's easy to get preachers on Saturday night and Monday night, but not so easy on, on Sunday night. But uh, Brother Stewart agreed to come and fill the pulpit tonight for us, and we're so delighted. He's pastor of the Blue Ridge View Baptist Church over in Pickens. I've known Stuart for many, many years and have appreciated his life and ministry. Uh, he has served in all kinds of positions across the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And uh, more than anything else, I can tell you about Brother Stewart. He believes the book, and he preaches the book. And he's done a fabulous job over there in Pickens. That church just keeps on growing. And uh, I remember, Stuart, I don't know how many years, Stuart, ago, you invited me over there to preach for you. And man, just a, it's a lively church. I just think George, but God has used him there and, uh, and done a great work. And so, Stuart, thank you for coming and, uh, and preaching tonight. So after we receive the offering and then Brother Ken comes to sing, Dr. Stuart Houston is going to come and bring the evening message. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you with thankful hearts tonight, Lord. We just lift this revival up to you, Lord. We just pray that it'll touch the hearts in need. We just lift up Brother Stuart, Lord, as he comes and brings us the message tonight, we lift up these tithes and offerings, and it may go do your will. And most of all, Lord, we just thank you for the blood that was shed for us on Calvary. In your name we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Amazing grace shall always be my soul 
king of praise for it was grace that bought my liberty I do not know just why he came to love me so he looked beyond my fault and so my I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous My fault and so my need. I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view. say amen. amen. We would all be hopeless, we would be helpless, we would be condemned without the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm grateful He loved us enough to look beyond our fault and see our need. And I don't know if you know it tonight, but the greatest need that you have in your life is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What an honor and a privilege it is for me to be at Eastside Baptist Church tonight. It's always a privilege to preach the gospel but it's very humbling when one of your heroes, one of your mentors uh, from afar calls you and asks you to come and fill his pulpit. I want you to know that I don't know if you know how blessed you are to have Brother Wayne Dickard as an interim pastor. I, I cannot think of a better man to, to feel as an interim pastor during a time of transition during the church than Wayne Dickard. He has been uh, a warrior in the South Carolina Baptist Convention, in the Southern Baptist Convention, in his stand on the Word of God. And I just appreciate him so much. Thank God for him and his investment in my life. I was just a teenager when I called Wayne to come and preach revival for me. <laughs> no, it was several. I've been at Blue Ridge View. It'll be 20 years in January. And I believe it's probably about 15 years ago, probably only the second man that I had called to come and do revival. And we had a great, great, tremendous week. Well, I can tell Campbell was here last night. You've got band-aids on the pulpit. 
Uh, but I, I, I don't know what this is for. What's that for, Dr. Dick? I mean, goodness. Uh, I, w- I was really worried as I prayed about what to preach. I-, I worried that my sermon was too long, and then he told me Chad was here last night. I, I don't have anything to worry about, amen? But uh, what a joy, what a joy to be with you. I want you to be finding in your Bibles the book of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. As I did pray about what to share with you, I- I'm not much of one to just pull out a sermon that I think is good and and, and go preach it at a church because I I think it worked at Blue Ridge View or wherever or or preachers have what they call sugar sticks that they bring out and want to sound the best. I I don't know that I've preached this sermon maybe two or three times. I I don't think I've only, I think, Brother Wayne, I've only preached it in one other church. But I want to speak to you tonight on this subject. Get in the fight. Get in the fight. Obviously, 1 Samuel chapter 17, it's a very familiar passage of Scripture to each of us that are in here tonight. Often this chapter is preached, as we know, in light of David's miraculous defeat of the mighty giant Goliath. And certainly that that story is one of the great power and and presence of Almighty God. It is a testimony to the power and the presence of the mighty God that we serve. But tonight, I really want us to look at the events that lead up to David's confrontation with Goliath. And in particular, I'm interested in the question that David will pose to his brother Eliab. We'll read in just a moment that uh, David looks at his brother and he, he, after uh, hearing all that's going on leading up to the battle with Goliath, David, David looks at his brother Eliab and he says, Is there not a cause? I want you to stand as we look at it and, and uh, you go ahead and stand as we read the inspired and errant, infallible Word of God. Get in the fight. Let's, let's pick up reading in verse number 23. The Bible says, And as he talked with them, behold, as David talked with them, behold, There came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel as he come up, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and take Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of of the living God. Boy, I just love the courage of David. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, David's eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep? In the, it's just, just disdain. Those little sheep in the wilderness, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for loving us. And I pray right now in these next few moments, Lord, that you would remove from our attention anything other than the Word of God. Father, I pray tonight that the, the preacher would not be seen, but Lord, I pray that you would be seen and that you would be heard. And I pray, Lord Jesus, continuing on this theme of revival, I pray that folks from Eastside Baptist Church, Lord, I, I pray that they would be uh, provoked tonight in their heart. I pray they'd get a burden in their soul to rise up and get in the fight for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this church in the days to come would have a tremendous impact on this community for the cause of Christ. Lord, as Brother Wayne prayed a while ago, I pray that you would allow me tonight to preach as a dying man to dying men, because we are. Lord Jesus, when that invitation is given, I pray simply that we would be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. David said, is there 
not a cause. I want to ask you tonight, Eastside Baptist Church, as you look around, I ask you tonight, as you look around our communities, as you look around our country, as you look around our world, is there not a cause? I think politically we could ask that question and we could answer that question absolutely. As we look at the political landscape of the United States of America, we would have to say that there is a cause to stand up for. There is a battle to be engaged in. We look out and we see things going on economically in our country and in other parts of the world and we we must ask ourselves, is there a cause To get in the fight with the Lord Jesus Christ to help uh, make a difference in some of these areas. Is there a cause domestically? I believe there is a cause today domestically. There are more than 3 million reports of child abuse in the United States every single year. An average of uh, 5 children die as a result of child abuse in our country every single day. Sadly, the United States actually has the highest child abuse rate on the entire planet. Approximately 20% of all child sexual abuse victims are under the age of eight. In the United States today, it is estimated that one out of every four girls is sexually abused before they become adults. I'm telling you, there is a cause domestically for us to stand up and be counted for the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there a cause morally? Do you know law enforcement officials estimate that about 600,000 Americans trade child pornography online? 600,000. In the United States today, 47% of all high school students have had sex. One out of every four teenage girls in the United States now has a sexually transmitted disease. The United States of America has the highest teen pregnancy rate on the entire planet by a wide margin. I'm telling you, there is a cause to stand for Christ because of the moral decay that our nation is in today. But is there a cause spiritually? I want you to listen very carefully to some of the stats I'm about to share with you. Did you know that one-fifth of American adults have no religious affiliation? Zero religious affiliation, and that number is increasing rapidly. The number of Americans who do not identify with any religion continues to grow at a rapid pace. Over 50% of our kids that graduate high school and go off to college over 50%. Matter of fact, I believe it's creeping more uh, to 60% to 65% of those that graduate high school and get a job or go off to college, they never return to church. Any church. You say, we're just not doing church right today. Did you hear what I just said? Hey, it's not because we're doing church traditionally or we're doing church in the contemporary manner. Hey, they're not coming back to any church. We're in a mess spiritually. Most Baptist churches have plateaued or they are in steady decline this evening. There were more people in Pickens County at home this morning than were in worship. Many of them claiming to be believers. There were more people engaged in social activities last night in Pickens County than were in Sunday school this morning. I just want to make a statement here. Listen to me. If your Saturday night activities cause you to miss Sunday morning worship, you need to change your Saturday night activities. Amen? Listen, there's a fight to engage in this evening. If you have not noticed it, our our children are bombarded daily to engage in sin. Our, Our nation grows more wicked and further from God by the very hour. Our churches are being rocked to sleep by cowardly preachers and carnal Christians. And all the while, the devil is laughing as he carts off millions of souls into hell. Is there not a call? David certainly believed uh, that there was, and he chose to stand for that cause. He chose not uh, to let the world or, or not to let the devil stand up and mock Almighty God. He chose to take the battle to the enemy. There was no questioning the allegiance of little David. Three things I want you to see very quickly tonight. Number one, I want you to notice the reality of the day. Notice the reality of the day here. I notice, first of all, the presence 
of the enemy. I want you to go back to verse number 1 in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I want you to notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse 1, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shaco, which belongeth to Judah and pitched between Shaco and Azekah, listen to this, in Ephes Damon. Ephes Dam. We're all aware that the Philistine army now had gathered together to battle the nation of Israel. But you need to understand the territory in which they gathered together to battle. It's not some little insignificant piece of land. Ephes Danum is a place that was approximately 16 miles southwest of Jerusalem. You say, preacher, why is that so special? I'll tell you why. It's because that was the homeland. That was the homeland of God's people. And so we realize here the presence of the enemy, he has invaded the homeland. It was in the center of the promised land. And they had come with one thing in mind, and that was to defeat the army of the living God. And so Goliath would come out. You know the story? He would come out daily. And he would mock the army of Israel. But listen to me, he was not just mocking the army of Israel. He was in reality mocking the God of the army of Israel. I want you to hear me tonight, church. The enemy is no longer operating in the big, bustling cities of our land today. He is at work right here in Liberty, South Carolina. The devil is at work right here in in Pickens County. You may not want to admit it tonight, but the enemy has invaded the homeland. He's on every corner. He's in every nook. He's in every cranny. He has invaded our schools. Satan has invaded our homes. Never, never have I seen adultery and abuse and neglect in our Christian homes more than I am seeing today. He's invaded our churches. We are living in a day of biblical illiteracy. People want to come to the house of God today and have it their way. Bible doctrine and Bible teaching has been replaced with self-help, psychology, and pragmatism. You know what pragmatism says? Pragmatism says if it draws a crowd, then it must be right. Then we ought to do it. Jesse, it's what I was talking about today in church. I never thought, Dr. Dickard, I never thought I would see the day when a preacher would stand behind the sacred desk and say that alcohol in moderation is okay. Never thought I would see it. I never thought I'd see the day when the church would debate whether homosexuality was a sin or not. I never thought I would see the day when a preacher would stand and use foul and offensive language from the pulpit and then be applauded for doing it. But I'm telling you, that's where we are today in our world. The enemy is here. He's on the move and we better wake up before the next generation lives in total apostasy. Eastside, this community, this city, this county is saturated with the influence of sin. And the enemy wants nothing more than to defeat and destroy not just this church, but every church and every home in our county, and he will do it by any means necessary. So I- I'm telling you tonight that there is a cause for us to fight for. We notice uh, the presence of the enemy, but here's the second reality of the day. I notice the plague of the people. Notice the plague of the people. Look at verse 11. Go back to verse 11. Notice what the Bible... When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. Now listen to this. And greatly afraid. Pay close attention there to how the people of God... Listen, those who had God on their side, Pay attention to how they reacted to the Philistine, to the enemy coming out on their territory and mocking them. Notice how they reacted to the presence of Goliath. They were plagued with fear. I'm telling you tonight, listen, this is not some just ragtag band of soldiers. This wasn't the Red Cross marching band of Mayberry, okay? I mean, this this was uh, Israel's finest led by King Saul, and yet they're plagued with fear. God had already given them the land. I mean, you go back and you study from the beginning of time, and, and you study the Exodus, man. These people had seen God part a Red Sea. These people had seen manna fall from heaven. These people had seen water come from a rock. And now they're standing in fear of a man. Not one man had the courage to stand for the Lord. 
I don't read about any of the men of valor having the courage to stand. I, I'm afraid this evening that many of us are plagued with fear as well. We're fearful to stand for the things of God. We have no desire to go against the flow. We have no desire to voice what we believe in and what we stand for. You see, the enemy has brought the battle to the homeland. And I'm telling you tonight, I'm giving us a clarion call. We must be on the defensive trying to regain the ground we have lost. We've got to get in the fight. So I see the reality of the day. What was it, preacher? It was dark. It was wicked. It was scary in many ways. So the reality of the day, it didn't look good. But I want you to notice the second thing real quick. I want you to notice the responsibility of David. The responsibility... Jesse, his father, he had sent David to take some provisions and check on the welfare of his brothers. But David was not satisfied with being a silent observer when he got on the scene. David was a child of God who felt a responsibility to act. Now, why was that? A couple of things I wrote down. First of all, I believe he felt a responsibility to act because his family was in the battle. Are you listening to me? Say amen. He, he felt he had a responsibility to that because right there was his family. We, we read about it in verses 17 and 18. He goes to see his brothers. You see, David's brothers were in the camp with Israel. They were at the forefront of the battle. He was compelled to support his brothers. I've got news for you tonight. Every single one of us in here tonight, we have family and we have loved ones who are on the battlefield today. They're in a fight right now with the devil. There are homes right now that are facing the prospect of being absolutely torn asunder by the enemy. I mean, marriages are crumbling all around us. There are saints of God who are battling the enemy. And you know what they need tonight? They don't need you to come and sit down beside them and give them all the answers to their problems. Some people just need you to sit down beside them and let them know you're praying for them, you love them, and you're in the battle with them. Amen? Some are there right now. Here, our children are being seduced by the lure of this world to forsake their faith. Join the ranks of the wicked. I had a conversation with my son this afternoon at lunch about this very thing. Pastors and church leaders are being tempted to compromise their stand, conform to liberal theology and ideology. Eastside, do you realize that our former presidential regime laid the groundwork that would demand that public schools recognize those who identify as transgender and allow them to use the restroom of their choice in our public schools? Did that just get by us? And that means basically bathrooms and locker rooms, co-ed facilities. I ask you again tonight, is there not a cause? Too many of us are plagued with fear. The church today has been silent for too long. Pulpits have been silent for too long. Christians on the job and in the classroom, we've been silent too long. Shame on us for not standing on the truth of the Word of God. Shame on us for just rolling with the punches. Shame on us for just going with the flow. Shame on us for not voicing what we believe in and who we stand for. What we ignored and tolerated yesterday, we're having to accept today. Huh? Some of you older generation, you know what I'm talking about. The church, this city, needs men and women of God to stand and boldly say, these things are not going to happen on my watch anymore. I'm going to get in the fight and I'm going to do what I can to turn the tide of what's going on. Shame on the church for not standing up and fighting for the truths that are outlined in God's Word. These things that I've spoken of, hey, just what I just spoke of, you know what, my friend, that, that's not an issue of equal rights. Those types of issues, are, uh, uh, it's an issue of hij the hijacking of America by the devil to make our city and our communities look like, more like Sodom and Gomorrah than they do Liberty, South Carolina. It's a declaration of war against our homes and our children and our communities. I've told my church, Blue Ridge View, regardless of what you choose to do, I'm running to the fight. I'm going to get in there and I'm going to do battle. The enemy has brought the battle to the homeland. So David felt a responsibility to act because he had family. He wanted to protect them. He had family in the battle. But second of all, his flock was left behind. Now, now go back and look at verse 20. 
I believe it's verse 20. Yeah, the Bible says, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. I mean, it gets him excited. <laughs> Boy, hey, it's almost like he let out a good old Holy Ghost. Woo, look at that fight down there. I mean, there's a battle coming. I'm in the army of the Lord. I, I want to get involved. His flock was left behind. He felt a responsibility today. David was a shepherd. He tended his father's sheep, and as he went to care for his brothers, he left the flock with a keeper. Now, I'm sure that David was mindful of those sheep that he had left behind. You know, a good shepherd cares for his flock. Now listen, if you forget anything, anything else I say tonight, remember this. There is a cause for the sheep of God's pasture. Many of you may not understand. You don't understand why your pastor does like me. And, it, it, and he gets a little red in the face and that vein sticks out in his forehead and, and uh, he wipes a, a little sweat off. You, you don't understand the great responsibility to the flock of God that a pastor really has. If he's a pastor worth his soul and he's truly called of God, man, he's got a genuine burden for that flock of which he oversees. I, I tell my church, that's why I preach so hard. That's why I, I try and warn my people of false doctrine. I, I try to warn them of sin and wickedness. I, I tried to warn them today to guard their testimony. Church, if we don't get in the fight, what's going to be left for the children? They're small. They're helpless. They're depending on us to stand for. I, I don't want those that I look after, up there on the hill at Blue Ridge, I, I don't want those that I look after have to uh, endure the horrors of the enemy without being prepared. I, I know they're going to face trials. I, I know they're going to face adversity and they're going to have to make their own decisions. But I want to protect them as much as I can from this old sinful world. I want to tell them how to go out every day and do battle. Listen, you can call me a fanatic. You can get upset with me. But I'm going to tell you, I tell my church, listen to me, alcohol will destroy your family. I tell you, listen to me, you may call me a fanatic, but you need to be committed to your church. You need to be here physically. You need to be here spiritually. You need to be here financially. Listen, the grass, sir, is not greener on the other side. Parents, we better know what our children are doing. We better know when they're doing it, who they're doing it with, what time they're going to be home after doing it. Amen? Whether they like it or not. Young people, you don't need to be at, at home alone, at a party, or in a car, on some back road with your boyfriend or girlfriend. Parents say amen right there. You don't need to date others who are not Christians. You don't need to date others who will cause you to compromise your Christian convictions. Now listen, I know you're tempted right now to send me a nasty email for not minding my own business, but listen, I'm going to die on some of those hills. I'm going to die. Listen, my, my family is in the fight. I'm going to do my best with the time I have left to stand for and protect the flock of God. If I have to slay a lion or if I have to slay a bear or a giant for their sake, I am going to do it. East side, listen, let's make sure there is a solid church for our children to be a part of in the future. Do you know you exist for those that don't even come here yet? That's a whole nother message. But David felt a responsibility to get in the fight also because his future was in the balance. Look back at verse number 8. I'm, I'm hurrying, going down the backside. Famous last words of the preacher. <clears throat> verse number 8. And he stood, cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I, Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. This is Goliath now. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. David knew he had a responsibility to act because his future was hanging in the balance. Losing or failure was not an option. If they failed to defeat the enemy, they would all become slaves. 
He said, we cannot, we cannot lose this battle. There is too much at stake for us not to get in the fight. You see, this life is not a game. It is a battle for the souls of men, women, boys and girls. Can I tell you something tonight? I haven't planned on saying this, but I want you to listen very carefully. Did you know that sin plays for keeps? Please listen to me tonight. Sin plays for keeps. The devil plays for keeps. I know Satan can't steal our salvation. Satan can't touch my soul. But he sure can rob me of my joy. And there may be many of you here tonight who once were faithful to the Lord, but you are no longer serving Him. You're unwilling to stand for God and you now live a life of defeat. Question. What is it that you love about Eastside Baptist Church. What is it that you want to remain for the younger generation? What is it that you want to see us shore up and strengthen for future generations? Do you want Eastside Baptist Church to be a place where the power of God is felt? Where saints are encouraged? Where sinners are safe? I don't know much Dr. Dickard, I don't know much, but I have realized this. Churches don't lose their power overnight. It usually comes about gradually through complacency or compromise. Before they realize it, as Samson, before they realize it, the spirit is gone. The future of this church depends on the stand you take today. Here's your money statement. This congregation will be no closer to the Lord, no stronger in her faith, and have no more power with God than the individuals who make it up. Now I want to say that again. This congregation will be no closer to the Lord, no stronger in its faith, or have no more power with God than the individuals who make it up. You've got to determine to be that individual. Do you really want revival? Then you need to pray, God send revival to me first. Get in the fight. You you know what it's easy for a church to do? I've had to fight this at Blue Ridge View. It's easy for a church to come to a point where they just coast. Budget's being met. Facilities are looking pretty good. We've kept the kids from writing on the walls with crayon. Didn't have much of a summer slump. Giving Giving is going okay. We tend to put it on cruise control. Listen. God never intended for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ just to maintain the status quo. We are to be charging the very gates of hell. Last thing I see here, I see the reaction of David. I see his reaction. David had faced the realities of the day. He well understood his responsibilities. No doubt there were others on the battlefield that day who knew what needed to be done. And so David decides to do something about the need that his people face. He chooses to get involved. Now, what moved David to get involved? Number one, his concern. David simply was concerned. You read about it in the first part of verse number 20. The Bible says he rose early in the morning to face the difficulty. He he, he knew There was a task to be fulfilled and he knew that he had a calling on his life to act on that task. Church, this community or Eastside Baptist Church in this community needs people who are genuinely concerned about the battle we face. We need those who will rise up early and seek God for help. Here, I've also learned this. Many may say they're concerned about the condition of their church, but their actions don't show much concern. We've grown complacent in our own little work. How long has it been since you have gotten a real burden for this community? How long has it been since you got a real burden for the needs of this dear church? I mean, you got a real burden about wanting to see more children saved and, and wanting to see more youth saved and called out into the ministry. When, when's the last time you got a real burden for the needs that you see around here? Man, we come and sit on our padded pews. We have our heat. We have our air condition. All the while, unaware of the trouble that our neighbor's going through. We're more concerned about getting home for supper and 
turning on the TV. We're more concerned about that than we are about the lost soul who desperately needs to be saved. Are you concerned tonight? Is there not a cause or are you in the fight? Oh, that God would burden our hearts for the needs of our day. But but there's a second thing there. Notice not only his concern, but notice his commitment. His commitment. David, uh, let's look at it real quick. Uh, Look at verse 22. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. David didn't hunt a shade tree to sit under as a conscientious objector. David came right to the trenches and ran unto the army. There was a work to do. Listen, there was a work to do, and he wanted to do it. He wanted to be a part. He wasn't looking for a way out. He was looking for a way into the fight. Notice there's no indecision in his life. You do not. You read verse 24, 26, verse 32. You don't have to wonder where David stood. You didn't have to question who his allegiance was to. Nobody had any doubts of whose side David was on. When others were fearful and others were fleeing, you know what David did? David stood up and David spoke up. David's father had sent him to take food to his brothers and check on. And when he arrived, he found the army of Israel terrorized by this Philistine champion, a giant by the name of Goliath. Notice verse 24, the Bible says, All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Certainly, certainly, you think about Goliath. You've seen pictures on flannel graphs. You you know, nine feet, nine inches tall. His coat weighed 125 pounds. His, His spear weighed 15 pounds. I mean, he's very intimidating opponent. However, when David saw the reaction of the army of Israel, according to verse 26, he stood up and according to verse 32, or he spoke up in verse 26, in verse 32 he stood up. There was no wavering or indecision on David's part. He was on God's side and no one could question where he stood. I want to ask you something, believer. Is there ever a question about whose side you're on? Or whose side I'm on? No one should ever have to wonder in the workplace if we're Christians. No one in the neighborhood should wonder or question where we stand. Matter of fact, when Sunday rolls around, they ought to be more concerned that your car is still in the driveway than they are that it's gone. Elijah asked the people, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. Halt literally means to bounce back and forth. And I'm afraid that's descriptive of, of many churches today. Many Christians today, they're on the Lord's side one day and on the world's side the next day. Friend, this is no time to be a spiritual chameleon. It changes colors according to our environment. Every believer, every Christian should plant their flag at the foot of the cross and boldly proclaim, I am a child of God. I am a Christian. God is my Father, and I am standing for Him. I am standing on His Word in this wicked age. So there was no indecision. There's no indifference. In verse 26, the toning of the enemy deeply disturbed David. He could not believe that God's people sat around, God's army sat around, and listened to this filth come out of an uncircumcised Philistine. They were allowing their name to be disparaged and they were allowing the name of God to be disgraced. And so it was this that caused him to speak up and stand up. And when Eliab, his brother, chastised him, David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? I'll give you the translation for that as I close. Basically, David said, should I not be speaking up? Is there not a reason for somebody to be saying and doing something? We're being belittled and God is being blasphemed by the enemy. David could not be silent or be still when he saw such behavior. He was not ashamed nor afraid to be on the Lord's side. Should not a Christian stand up and let a lost world know that Jesus died for their sins? Should not a church stand up and be counted among those who march under the blood-stained banner of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, commitment is not shown by idle talk. Commitment is shown by willingness to roll up our sleeves, get in the fight, and get involved. Commitment's hard to find in the church today. You don't believe that? Ask the nominating committee. They have trouble filling positions because people don't want to get involved. 
We can't get people to commit to staying in the nursery. We can't get people to commit to being greeters in the parking lot. People don't want to commit to much these days. Boy, I'm glad somebody was committed enough to share the gospel with me. I, I, I am so glad somebody was committed to pray when I didn't care. And they were committed to preach when I was unaware of my own needs. Listen, I'm glad I had a preschool teacher that taught me Jesus loves me. I'm glad I had a missions... Anybody remember mission friends? I'm glad I had a mission friends teacher who taught me about the need to take the gospel to the nations. I'm glad I had a children's director who cared enough about me to take us on overnight retreats and teach us the Word of God. I'm glad I had a Sunday school teacher who did not just see his job as one day a week. He saw that job as 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He called me because he cared about me. He took me on trips, took me fishing, took me bowling because he cared about me. He showed me the love of Christ. Bless God. I am grateful, Dr. Dickard, for a hot-hearted preacher who cared enough about me to preach the truth to me, even when it hurt. He did it because he loved me. He loved my brother. He loved my family. And he wanted to see us safe. And I'll tell you something, my friend, because he preached hard. And there was a witness year after year after year. Finally, last Sunday morning, I baptized my 49-year-old brother who finally came to faith in Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, it's worth getting in the fight. Hallelujah, glory to God. Matter of fact, he coaches at Pickens. The head coach was there to see him baptized, and he heard one of the parents of his players sing, and the boy can sing real good, and he told him Friday night, he said, Brian, I didn't know you could sing. He said, that surprised me more than seeing Eric get baptized. <laughs> Amen. Are you committed to making a difference for the cause of Christ? Where would we be if Jesus hadn't been committed to the cross? And then I notice his confidence. He runs to the battle. If you and I didn't know better, we may look at that and believe that the odds were against David. Obviously, it's evident to see that he couldn't defeat Goliath. But whereas we would see and say, Goliath is too big to hit, David looked at him and said, Goliath is too big to miss. He knew that God was on his side. Church, there is no doubt that we're living in dark days. But we serve one who has never lost a battle. Let's not be afraid to get in the fight. Psalm 34, 22, The Lord redeemeth the soul of His servants, and none of them that trust in Him shall be desolate. How big is the God you serve? Today is a clarion call to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you can tell, I am burdened today. These are desperate times. I am sick and tired of seeing the devil destroy families. I am sick and stinking tired of going home and hearing some guy that calls himself a preacher on TV pat me on the back and tell me how good I am. I'm so sick of seeing our teenagers destroyed by drugs and alcohol. These are desperate times. My fear is that either we've come to the place where we don't care or we don't realize how desperate the times are. Well, listen, I'm, I'm sounding the alarm. Times are desperate. I have no doubt this evening that there's a cause for the people of God to fight for. It's greater than I've ever seen. Countless people are in need of the Lord today. David was just a youth and God used him. Little is much when God is in it. Who's on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be His helpers? Other lives to bring. Who will leave the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for Him will go? Thy call of mercy, by Thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are Thine. Chosen to be soldiers in an alien land. Chosen, called, and faithful for our captain's band. In the service royal, let us not grow cold. Let us be right loyal, noble, true, and bold. Master, Thou wilt keep us by Thy grace divine. Always on the Lord's side, Savior, always thine. Let's get in the fight. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed.
Here's the invitation tonight. I thank you for your patience. I know I went a little long, but the invitation is very simple tonight. First of all, if you're in here tonight and you have never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, then you're not even in the army yet. Boy, our, our invitation and certainly the invitation of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus Christ is for you to come tonight. Turn from your sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and call out to Him to be Savior and Lord of your life. There's a man in here tonight that needs to do that. There's a young lady in here tonight that needs to do that. And we're going to invite you to come in just a moment. When I have everyone stand, I'm going to pray and have everyone stand. The musicians are going to play. You need to step out of that pew, walk down this aisle, take Brother Wayne by the hand and say, Pastor, I need to be saved today. I want my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to be saved. Second of all in here tonight, there are some of you that are really serious about revival coming to Eastside Baptist Church. And you're going to want to come and gather around this altar and shed tears of burden for those that need Jesus, but for those others who simply need to get in the fight, no doubt there are probably over three, four, five hundred members of Eastside Baptist Church, maybe more. You're like my church. Half of them showed up today. Where's the other half? Let's pray for them. Let's get off our knees and let's go find them. Challenge them to get in the fight. Sir, what do, you, what do you hope to leave behind here at Eastside Baptist Church for future generations? Are you going to take a stand today for the truths found in the Word of God? Or are we just going to let the, the generation that comes behind us, are we just going to be content with them living in total apostasy? If you really want to see revival, if you really want to see revival come to this church, you need to, give, need to ask God to give you a burden for what's going on around you. And when He gives you that burden, you need to get up off your knees, roll up your sleeves, and get in the fight. Father, we love You. Lord Jesus, we thank You for loving us. And Lord, I would pray right now in this invitation, I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that You would move and that You would speak and that we would be obedient. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want you to stand right where you are. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. They're going to begin playing a hymn of invitation. As they begin to play, Brother Wayne's down here. If you need to speak to him, I want you to come right now. Some of them are already on the altar. If God has spoken to your heart tonight, would you come right now?